Hi, my name is Yulian Oku, and I'm Running Start's 2020 ambassador. Running Start is a nonpartisan nonprofit that trains young women like me to run for public office. We instill young women with the confidence, connections, and capability they need to become political leaders. So March is Women's History Month, when we commemorate all the amazing women that have paved the way for young women to follow in their footsteps. Because of their example, young women, just like me, can say, I look like a politician. Running Start is celebrating Women's History Month 2021 with a Her Story series about women who are firsts in politics. Selena Caesar Chavan is one of those trailblazers. Before entering politics, she launched and grew an award-winning research management consulting firm. She was elected to be a member of the Canadian Parliament in 2015 and was the first Black woman elected to represent Whitby, Ontario. She became Parliamentary Secretary to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Development before she resigned in 2019. She has just published a memoir and leadership book, Can You Hear Me Now?, about her life and experience as a young Black woman entrepreneur and politician. I learned so much from my conversation with her, and I know you will too. I'd love to get any, like understanding of what that defining moment for you was um that kind of that you either you told yourself or it was a push from someone else that said hey yeah i'm i have to run for office so it's interesting that i didn't um get a push from anyone else <laughs> um, i was never asked i was never sort of like oh my god you would be great i was in a, a mba program that i was taking in 2013 so i'm not very political either i really wasn't i my first political science class was during 2013 and uh really watched it on tv but wasn't like this actively political person by any stretch of the imagination i say i play a politician on tv my kids my daughters are the real politicians in the house. um but but to be honest i was in that course and they were talking about you know how politicians or people in politics can help with the policy that helps business um of course it's an mba class help business uh tr trade or achieve policies that helps their business function better and i was just like oh that's that's interesting i had been working my company that i ran was a health healthcare based research management firm so i ran clinical trials for major pharma i'd also ran national epidemiology studies on neurological conditions alzheimer's parkinson's epilepsy things like that and I'd seen like from a, a very granular level how people who couldn't afford their medications, even in Canada, um, couldn't afford their medications, had to move from one province to another where on that provincial drug formulary, their drugs were covered. So they would like actually sell their homes and move to get that opportunity to get their drugs covered or they'd you know, be forced to separate or to file for divorce so that they could get services covered. And I thought, wow, there is an intersection between business and research and the capacity to be a politician and enact policy. And I just thought, hmm, sounds like something I want to do. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, that's really interesting. So that kind yeah. of wants me to, that's, that kind of allows me to kind of take a step back now and understanding like your background. So, um, and I know people probably asked you this before, but I think that's so interesting, um, like your story of like coming to Canada at a young age um, in Grenada and like how uh, maybe, that like your situation growing up and like kind of being um being I guess like an immigrant and then kind of being um kind of someone that's a bit of a different than others and not seeing that representation already um how has that maybe also changed or it allowed you to make that decision like did you ever factor in like the oh, representation at all great question um that's a great question I don't think I've ever been asked that question before but I I don't think so. Um, and and I, I'll probably give you a little bit of context because as a woman of color, as a black woman, when I started my business, I really didn't want to have to deal with the, oh my goodness, I'm dealing, I'm, I'm working with a owner of a, a pharmaceutical company or a research management company that's a woman, that's black, that's young. And I really didn't want to have to deal with those hurdles. So I never put my face on my advertising as an entrepreneur. I only use my company logo and my company name, and I let my services speak for themselves. So when I got into politics, it was sort of like I'd already established, I was an award-winning entrepreneur, I already established myself. And I wasn't really thinking of the 
entering into politics from an equity in terms of race, gender, or intersectionality. Mm -hmm. I was take, thinking of politics in terms of creating equity in terms of, man, people are like struggling out there from a, a, from a broad sense and more of a socioeconomic sense, the, the people who are most vulnerable sense, but not necessarily from the sense of an intersectional feminist perspective. And so that immigrant experience, my background experience wasn't really, wasn't really at the forefront when I entered, mm -hmm. but when I got in, it was like, oh yeah, now I'm going to need to use all of those tricks. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So that's a perfect segue because then uh, kind of before we get into your time spent in office, that initial period of you running and campaigning, did those identities, the, the, the things in which you had to think about when you think about like intersectionality, did those come into a factor? Were they particularly difficult, uh, difficult while you're, while you're running? Like, was that something you had to see as a hurdle? Yeah. So I also say no to that. Really? That's so interesting. I know, right? So <laughs> every now and again, so before I would go to to knock on doors, right? So I knocked on about, so I did a by-election because the, the member of parliament that was in the in our riding or our district, he passed away. And so we were into a by-election and I lost the by-election and then had to go into the general election. So 2014, lost the by-election, 2015, won the general election. And so I knocked on about 40 thousand doors um in whitby a whitby's a, a, a town that has one hundred and thirty thousand people knocked on about forty thousand doors and every time i'd get ready to go out to knock on doors i would be like oh my god okay today i'm going to meet someone who's going to talk about my race who's going to talk about the fact that he doesn't like women or some like i'm going to be met with something and like you're like okay yes i could do this yeah you know i'm gonna do you know, what are you gonna say yeah i got that in my head i got it good and then i get to the door and they'll be like no i either hate the liberal policy or something. It wasn't necessarily about me. It was about the mm. brand that I was selling, so to speak, at the door. And so, um, and my constituency is 70% white. So I should, wow. so I'm the first black person that has been elected in any capacity in Whitby, not, let alone black woman. The first black woman elected in this region, in Durham region, which is just mm. east, 40 minutes east of Toronto. So n never had that. So I always thought, oh my God, this is going to happen. Not once. When, it, when I got to the door and I started talking about policy, I ta started talking about my background and my experience in business and, you know, that sort of thing. That's what people were interested in. And they would challenge me on that. And I wouldn't fight them at the door. I wasn't at the door to convince anybody to change. You know, if they were conservative or Republican in the United States, I wasn't there to convince them to change. I was there to convince them that I was going to be the best person to represent them, irrespective of the, the views that they held as a conservative or a liberal. And that's, that's, and, and again, the previous member of parliament was a conservative finance minister, was that represented the town for like forever. It's, it was called Flaherty country. Like people just were, I was the lamb to the slaughter that black female liberal, like, where is she going? <laughs> Does she actually have nothing to do? <laughs> And I, I didn't feel any of that. And I didn't, I, maybe I didn't feel it because I'd been working in neurological research for so long. It is a ma white male dominated that mm -hmm. I was just like, let's just talk about the business. We're just here to talk about the business. That changed when I got, now ask me the question about it when I'm in politics, because that's going right. to be a different answer. <laughs> right. Wow. Well, that's interesting. I, that kind of idea of like substantive representation, like they want to see substance and that that was like a priority for them, um, yeah. which I think worked out in your case, because I think that's something that I've obviously seen that you value. So then that leads me to your time spent in office. So now, you know, you made it regardless of all of the... Uh, any preconceived obstacles or hurdles, um, I'd love for you to take some time to describe your time spent in office, maybe kind of start off with some of the expectations you had coming in and then what ended up being the reality of some situations. So the expectation coming in, so the liberal brand, and, and I want to preface this by saying I left politics and I don't, I don't want to preempt your questions, but I'm, I'm going to talk a lot about my experiences. 
But in my, even in my resignation, resignation letter, I want women to run, but run in packs, run like the squad. Like, you know, like you have to have people that are going to protect you. So go back to your question now. Um, when I ran, it was the, the brand that the Liberal Party was selling was open, transparent government, government done differently, bold, transformative, uh, diversity is our strength. Of feminist government, which I thought meant intersectional feminism, but it doesn't. <laughs> They're just two separate words. Right. In my mind, they were one word, and I was like, "Yes!" And it's like, "No, they don't understand what that is." Um, but you know, I, I I was sold that. Like, so that's the package that I bought, and I was like, I could sell this package. Like, it is so good. It's everything that I want to be. I want to be bold. I want to be transformative. People in our communities need this. So I'm going to sell it. And that was the expectation when I got in. When I, yeah, when I was going in. Did you ask about when I was in there? Yeah. Yeah. And then now, yeah. Yeah. And so when I was in there, one of the first conversations that I had with the prime minister, so I was elected in October of 2015. The first conversation I had with the prime minister, the first time I was ever, ever in parliament. So like starting a new job, like first time in the building, <laughs> like really not a political person. First time in the building was a December of 2015, where my first meeting with the prime minister, I sit down and he announces, of course, his cabinet in November, just the month before. And it is gender parity. And he says, because it's 2015, it went around the world. Everybody knows that he says it. Um, but there were no Black people in his cabinet at all. And so when I went to him, I said, look, if you're looking to fill any gender or racial gaps in your cabinet, I don't want this job as your parliamentary secretary. I'm perfectly happy being the member of parliament for Whitby. I, I don't want to be tokenized in this role. And I was told, no, 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 of course you're here on merit. You know, where you're smart. Da, 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 da. And even as that first year went on, um, as a parliamentary secretary, what you do is you're like a tag team to the prime minister, especially a prime minister who's as busy as he was. So you'll, if he can't attend an event, if he's doing an event in the West and he one comes up in the East, it'll be like, Selena, you go attend that one. Selena, like, you're going to do this. I'm going to do that. We're going to tag team this out so we could cover more ground. Essentially what a parliamentary secretary does. By the end of that first year, I had attended three international events with the prime minister or on behalf of the prime minister. The first was a trip to Washington for the state dinner, um, in, in which I wasn't invited to the state dinner. Um, I was just invited to meet President Obama and that was it. The second was for the opening of the National Museum in Washington, of uh, the African American Museum. And the third was an invitation to um, the inauguration of, of President Okufo Otto in Ghana three events that were really black events mm -hmm. and three events in which I had no other duties, but to just show up and, and sit and be a spectator at the event. And that was really hurtful because I, I really believed I, I bought the package of a, a fe, at least a feminist government that understood diversity is our strength and getting in there I realized that it was just diversity. I felt as if it was just diversity as a window dressing mm -hmm. and feminism as a window dressing, especially when it was related to me. And I was the only black female member of parliament elected in 338 people. So that isolation and then that feeling of, oh my God, I, I'm, I might really be a token was, um, disappointing and that was a that was the first time so you asked me a series of questions earlier but that was the first time that I felt in my life like a black person like a woman and like a black woman wow that <laughs> I, I I just had to take a second because I think that that is one like incredibly disappointing experience and um, I think it says a lot that there was so much that you're willing to hold out hope for um, and to not have those like needs met um, on your end, I think um, is definitely incredibly disappointing to say the least. But yeah. I, I think that that kind of then leads me 
to this next question about how one def- like how do you define holding one accountable in in politics or holding um, a politician accountable and then and how do you in doing that also while you're in office stay true to like your constituents and the core values that you came in with throughout your term that's important right so i mm-hmm. i always say you know Clayton Christensen, who is a, a professor or was a professor, he died very recently um, for Harvard, uh, says this very li- important line during his, in his essay called How You Will Measure Your Life. And he says, it is important to keep your principles and values. It's easier to keep your principles and values 100% of the time than it is to keep it 98% of the time. So I'm always guided by my values. I'm always guided by the principles that have, you know, guided my life right from the beginning. And so utilizing that and and standing up for my constituents was relatively easy as long as I was guided by those principles. So even if I was listening to some of their concerns and, um, and, you know, had to even go against my own government um, with their concerns, I was okay to do that because I knew that the the most important thing to me was ensuring that I stayed true to those values. Um, And, you know, we had an instance where, you know, we introduced a small business tax credit, for example, and it was total, it was a total fiasco. And members of my constituency were small business owners like I was, and they were having such a hard time because they would lose money with this this new policy that we introduced. And I had no problem saying to the minister of finance, like, you need to fix this because people are struggling with it. And I, as someone who has been a small business owner, as someone who had life outside of politics, you can't do this. And the decision was reversed, not just because I said it, although Mm -hmm. I do have that kind of influence, but... (laughs) of that (laughs) you have to love yourself in all of this and big yourself Mm -hmm. up in all of this or else they will eat you alive definitely um Um, but you know i i i I still challenge like i challenge not just on equity issues but i challenge on 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 issues related to legislation and i i always said like you know at one point people were saying that you know because i talk about race i'm the, the most racist mp and all i see is race all the time blah 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 and i said like what, you know, why doesn't she just focus on her job? I said, I could walk and chew gum at the same time. Like I could read legislation, I could vote, I could challenge legislation, but I could also raise awareness about equity and justice issues, which I think when we talk about our democracy are totally intertwined and totally are, is what my constituents expect me to do. That's what I promised them at the door with bold, transformative government done dis- differently, open, transparent, intersectional feminist approaches. Mm-hmm. That's what, I, that's what I offered. Wow. I think that's incredible. So that kind of um, leads me to like wonder then, because I think while you were able to still effectively, I would say, do the job that you set out to do while still facing um, some experiences while you're there and like some of the hurdles while you're in office, um, how did you grapple with that? As you just mentioned, since people kind of took those experiences that you had and you speaking out against them as a way to frame that like you can't do anything else um, or that this is all that you talk about. So how did you, I guess, in your daily experience as a politician there, um, keep, how did you keep, I guess, keep inspiring yourself to keep going regardless? Um, I think anytime, and I have to remember that I'm talking to young women who, who might be interested in politics here, anytime that you are facing a challenge, whether it's politics or in business or in your community work or in your activism, it is going to get hard. This work is hard because it is hard. <laughs> like It's going to be tough. And you are, if you're on the right side of history, ch- chances are you're going to be gaslit. You're going to be facing a lot of challenges. You need to remember how you got there and why you're there. And the answer to both of those questions for me were the people. How I got there was because people voted me in. People always say that Justin Trudeau was my boss. No, he wasn't. I was, my boss was 130,000 people who 
had enough faith and confidence in me to vote me into office. And some of them didn't vote for me and I still had to represent them. And why I was there was because I'm passionate about people. I want to do the best for those who are vulnerable, who are marginalized, who are on the outskirts of our society and need government help the most because they're not getting it anywhere else. So in, in all of that gaslighting and all of that, um, and when I say gaslighting, girl, it wasn't, oh gosh. I, wish I, would, I wish somebody would describe what gaslighting is. Gaslighting is not just like the little spark. Mm. It is like they throw gasoline on you and then they light it and then they add some kindling and then they add like the big log and they throw more kindling. <laughs> and they're like, <sighs> wow i'm like it's enough like you're warming up like no we're just gonna add some more (laughs) especially when you're talking about race especially when you're talking Mm. about these topics that tend to make people feel really awkward especially when you say the word black Mm -hmm. oh why can't we describe it a different way you know african american like no i just want to say black and it's like you know it's even when people describe me it's like the lady you know the lady with the scarf and she was wearing that that t-shirt and she had those earrings on it's like the black lady yeah yeah her her (laughs) oh gosh (laughs) (laughs) yeah Fuck, I'm okay with it. But, but you know, the gaslighting comes and you have to mm-hmm. like really focus in on why am I doing this? Otherwise you, you will like, you'll be out. And there were times mm-hmm. even when I was being gaslighted for various stuff that I was like, is this worth it? Mm-hmm. Are, are the death threats against me and my children worth it? Am I being, being sued? Am, is it worth it? Mitigation? Is it worth it? Like, are all these things worth publicly? I'm, my reputation is being like, well, I thought it was being totally mm-hmm. ruined. Is it worth it? And then I had to really think, I think back to that line from, from Clayton Christensen. And I also think about the people that I serve and I say, yes, it's worth it because I know I'm on the right side of history here. And I know that the people that need it the most, the most vulnerable in our society need me to speak up. Wow. I just want to clap every single time <laughs> you respond to these questions because it's like always some really incredible wise statement. Um, and I really appreciate that. And I think that kind of then leads me um, to think about folks like, for example, um, just, you know, the past month we saw uh, ushered, ushered in a new administration from our, I guess, our side, which is exciting to say the least. Congratulations, um, America. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> but, um, but I think regardless, something really, really important about and critical about that moment in ushering in that new, um, I would say, era is um, someone like Kamala Harris, who has been coined as saying that you know, while she is the first, um, she does not want to be the last and she's not going to be. And I think that that is incredible um, explanation of what it's like to to seek out and like continue to pursue representation. Um, So so my question to you in regards to that is, have you then seen maybe a shift or an impact at all, whether small or big, due to the representation and your presence that you that you brought in with your win and your time in office. Yes. So uh, there has literally I think when you do politics differently and one of the reasons why um I love seeing um Madam Vice President Kamala Harris, you know, in her outfit, in her Timberlands, in her sneakers, like just doing politics differently. Um, and really being authentic in that representation, not the way someone else has pre-described it for her, but the way she has defined it for herself is critically important. I think think if if young people take that as an example the most, that is what we need to see. When I was in politics, I would do videos about, uh, and this was before um, AOC was doing these videos. (laughs) Um, Tell AOC I said that. Uh, (laughs) Okay, noted. (laughs) <laughs> but I would do videos of like, you know, doing makeup tutorials and I'll do my hair videos. And I get these questions like, you know, these responses like, you know, Selena, the most important thing that you do in the morning is not your lipstick. And I'll be like, girl, 
what? I can't wear red lipstick with this dress. Like that is <laughs> such an, imp- like these are important. Right. This is, and I didn't want to lose my femininity. I didn't want to lose that in the space of who I was. And also it's very engaging, I think too, for people who are on the margins of, of politics, who we want to engage to see that we're just regular people and I have problems doing my 4C hair. I have problems matching my makeup. My daughters take 15 minutes to put makeup on. I take four and I did a four minute, four minute makeup video to show people how quickly I put my makeup on. And, you know, that representation, that authentic representation matters. So after I left and, and like speaking up on issues, like there's critical things too. It's not only about makeup, although it's very important. Um, but there were critical things too that I was talking about raising awareness on as well as legislation. Um, I mean, all levels of government. The first time ever we in Canada, we have a leader of a federal national federal party that is a black woman. We, st- we still only have one black female member of parliament, um, Marcy Ian and Anna Mae Paul, I should have mentioned her name, is, an, uh, is she hasn't been elected yet, but she is the leader of the, the Green Party in Canada. But we're seeing all over, you know, um, councillors, people are just running for, for local uh, municipal representation, for provincial representation, at least they're running, they're, they're thinking about it, they're actually exercising their, their capacity to be active within the political system and not standing on the periphery. And I've seen that just explode. And I, I won't say that it's just me. I think that there's just, there's just a shift People understand that they need to shift now and we need to, the urgency of now requires us to get civically engaged and get active. Definitely. Oh, I I love that. I think the idea of just trying things and like putting yourself out there, you know, is already so big. It is huge and monumental. So I think the fact that people are even entertaining those thoughts are, is really, really important. Um, And that kind of, then wants me to ask if you have any advice or tips for any like budding young women that want to run for office in the future or thinking about it or are hesitant. So number one, show up. Okay. Sh- show up, um, show up to volunteer, show up to do. And, and I'm saying this knowing that I didn't volunteer. I didn't do any of this stuff, but show up to, to volunteer, show up to Show up where you're passionate, I should say. Um, I showed up, you know, in research, in neurological research, right? And I took that experience with me into politics. Show up wherever you're passionate. Don't get shook by the fact that, you know, you might be a single mom or you might be an entrepreneur or you might like baking and that has no relation to politics. Yes, it does. Show up. Okay. And we could get into how they all relate. We won't do it now, but they all have impact into politics. Number, number two is show up, but be authentic. We cannot continue to want these spaces to change, these institutions to change, organizations, companies, communities, schools, wherever you are to change. If we keep losing part of ourselves to fit into their existing infrastructure, into the limitations of someone's existing imagination of what that space should have looked like. We cannot expect it to change. We cannot expect things to be different if we're always afraid to be who we are in those spaces. They can only change when we show up as our authentic selves and bring every single hurt, shame, a pain, mistake that we've made and augment it with all our strength, beauty, joy, laughter. Because all of those experiences, not just the ones that we learned in school or in the companies that we work for, but every single experience that we brought in our lives adds value to us and therefore is an asset to any organization that we Mm -hmm. step into. They are blessed that we show up. So why not show up as our full selves no matter what that self is as long as it's safe to do so show up 100 percent authentic and the rest will i guarantee you be history 
Wow, that was incredible. Thank you so, so much um, for providing like incredible insight. Um, and I think I already in this time, like honestly inspired me to go up and even think like potentially run one day. And I really- Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm signing you up. Where are we doing this? Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> okay, I'll definitely- Everything's on Zoom right now, us. right? So I could like yeah, manage your campaign from Canada. It's totally cool. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. Definitely going to take you up on that. Um, that's amazing. Um, I think your story is incredible. And I know, I think everyone in the world needs to hear this. Uh, thank you so much for even taking some time out of your busy schedule to talk to me about this. Um, and I think, did you have any like other like last comments or? Anything? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just going to comment on what you just said, because people always say, you know, thank you so much for, you know, taking time out of your busy schedule. And while I appreciate that, I really want to thank you right? To whom much is given, much is expected. There's an expectation that, you know, of all the millions of interactions that happened in the universe for me to be here sitting with you at this particular time talking about this story, it's not an accident. It is definitely intentional. And so I want to thank you for lining up all of your millions of interactions that happened before you to be in this space um, to chat with me and to create this space, create space mm -hmm. for individuals who are maybe feeling a little apprehensive about not just running, but about their next, about what they do, about how they challenge, about how they change the world, giving the space for, for us to have a conversation about how one person did that. Because yeah. when one person does it, then two people then three, then we change the world. And that's what's really important. So thank you for giving me this time to just share my story because stories are so sticky and we need to say them. Definitely. Wow. Oh, oh my gosh. I really appreciate this. You have redefined what I think politics could look like um, in the future. So I think that that's a massive, but yeah. Okay. Well, they, I, I keep saying thank, thank you. you. But <laughs> Thank you everybody. <laughs>